Okay, so let's get on to the next example. But before I get into the next example, I really want to kind of talk about um, implied and restricted domain and how that can be beneficial to us in our kind of learning of functions and their inverse. So just remember, that, like the implied domain is, you know, basically the set of numbers that the function is defined, and that's actually what we have been doing so far in this chapter is finding that implied domain and. You know, when we talk about implied domain, it was, unless we have a restriction, you know, so far we've covered like not dividing by zero or taking the square root of a negative number, mm -hmm. then our domain is going to be, you know, defined, at least for the functions that we've covered in this chapter. So in de implied domain is just, you know, kind of looking at the restrictions based on the function that you are provided. Whereas the restricted domain is basically going to be a restriction that we are going to add to a function. So if we just want to say, you know, I want to graph a function, but I only want to, you to graph the positive values of that function, that is going to be an additional restriction that we're going to add. And a lot of restriction, uh, restricted domains, you know, kind of come up where they are implied, like in word problems. You know, for instance, if we're talking about usually time, we're usually just talking about, you know, positive time, not going back in time. Um, you know, usually when we're talking about height, we're figuring out that like the ground is going to be zero and you're not really going like below ground, for instance, like the path of a ball or something uh, or also like the length you know of something we're not usually getting into like negative length of fencing or you know something crazy like that so um, that's kind of the difference the implied domain is basically looking at the function and making sure for what values that is defined and then adding a different restriction or part of context of a word problem would be our restricted domain so this comes in handy because if we follow our general kind of rule of thumb that we did for the previous examples as far as finding the inverse we would notice that this function is not the inverse of this function is not going to be a function now um, what I wanted to do I don't think I actually added this on there which I wanted to, which was to um, make sure we could go ahead and define this as like define what the equation is as well as define what the equation of the inverse was. So um, I didn't write that in there, so I'm just going to write this. So let's write equation of f of x and f inverse of x. Okay. So, you know, basically, if you remember, like our transformations of functions, you can see here, this is a quadratic, um, looks like the quadratic is being shifted up two units, as we're going by ones here, one, two, you can see that um, it's kind of holding that composure that I believe it's, you know, over one up one. So I would write this function, or at least an estimation, again, it's not always going to be perfect. Um, but I would be pretty confident that this is going to be represented by x squared plus two. Right, and just by looking at the graph, I feel fairly confident that's exactly, because obviously that one-to-one -one, um, relationship is gonna be for the x squared with no stretching or compressing, and then obviously we just have a vertical shift up to. All right, so that's our function. Now, if we were to go ahead and sketch this, doo -doo -doo, sketch this graph, or I'm sorry, sketch the inverse, then we would just take our nice little y equals x line, right? And then I could take these points and I could kind of like swap them. So I could say this point is three comma one, this point is 0, 2. And this point is negative 1, 3. So therefore, just swapping these, I would go at 2, 0, um, 3, 1, and negative 3, 1. And in our general understanding or topic of vector, of functions, I'm sorry, let's do it like that. We know that this is not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test, right? When you take a vertical line, with that as a horrible vertical line, but when you take a vertical line and that vertical line crosses, still not even better, it's kind of hard with this. <laughs> you can see it's my vertical line. Um, but you can see when the vertical line passes the function you know, more than once, it's not a function. So the kind of going back to the question is, you know, can we go ahead and write a restriction that would make this a function? So can we restrict our original function f of x so that when we find the inverse, it is going to be a function? And yeah, there's infinite many ways we could do this. Um, one way that kind of comes to my head is, you know, kind of a rather simple example. Why don't we just restrict f of x for x values that are greater than or equal to zero? So remember, x values, you know, along your x-axis for all values positive, that's just going to be the x values to the right. So if I was to graph that, it would look something like this. 
right? So I'm only graphing the positive form of my function. Therefore, when I find the inverse, you can see now that that function is only going to represent this form of the inverse. And that is exactly a inverse function. Now, let's go ahead and re-graph this over here. I'm not sure why I provided this, but we might as well use it, right? Okay, let's, you know, so let's kind of see then, you know, what this kind of looks like uh, or what if we could write maybe an equation of this for our f inverse function. Now, I did a really, really bad job of kind of graphing it, but if you kind of look and at least your familiarity of our parent functions, you would kind of see that this most resembles a, you know, square root function, right? So we have a square root function, and you could say that it's also being shifted two units to the right. So we got to think, all right, as far as my transformations go, like how do I represent, you know, shifting to a, a uh, radical two units to the right? Well, I could rewrite that as x plus Two. Okay, and again, it's just going to be the positive form and so on and so forth. So what I'd like you to do is before we move on to example number three, as far as learning how to do this algebraically, what I want you to do is just kind of look at, you know, our function as well as our inverse function and go back to like our original warm up as far as talking about how to find that number that you're thinking about in your head. Look at how this function and this inverse function are related to one another. Right? Look at the inverse operations that are being applied, and what that will do is that will help us, um, or that will help you as far as when we get into this next example, um, be able to start seeing more of that relationships of the function and its inverse function. So let's go ahead on to example three. 